Electronic Music Podcast. All right. A little bit uh, different setup here, but uh, here we are. This is the Voice of Electronic Music Episode 16 with David Paul and Mark DeSantis. Hello. Is that right, Santis? DeSantis. DeSantis. Okay, awesome. Um, So, yeah, a little bit different setup here. Uh, We did a podcast before with three people, and uh, fitting them all in that DJ booth was uh, kind of a nightmare. So uh, here we are. We're facing the opposite direction. You're getting a little 360 uh, uh, tour of of Halcyon here uh, in San Francisco, arguably one of San San Francisco's best nightclubs. How are you guys doing? I'm great. Thanks for having us out. Let's uh, let's move this a little closer to you. I'm a shorty. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) Cool, man. Um, Yeah, so thanks uh, thanks for coming down. Um, thanks for having us. Yeah, our pleasure. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So uh, David and, and Mark are uh, DJs here from uh, San Francisco. And uh, as long as I have been in the scene here, they have been doing their thing and, uh, you know, playing shows, promoting shows, uh, putting together shows, uh, spinning some of the best parties. And, uh, and you know, Mark's gotten into uh, production recently. Was it yeah. recently? Yeah, last couple years. Last couple years? Yeah. Okay. But it sounds like you've already had some, like, charting songs which is like <laughs> kind of kind of a big he's deal he's very humble about it <laughs> yeah. but yeah yeah I've, I've been lucky. let it out mark yeah. <laughs> <laughs> lucky. well very talented yeah <laughs> no, no big deal just uh just hop into the game and get get charts yeah <laughs> if mark doesn't explain it well i will <laughs> yeah, <there you> go. <laughs> yeah so mark released uh, uh an ep uh last year right i think it's been a little over a year now well yeah last year yeah 20 2018 on um Household Digital on Tone's yeah. label, who you had here recently. Mm-hmm. And I think Tone actually mentioned it too, but yeah, Mark did. Uh, Mark made a three-track EP, and uh, they were all in different genres. One was techno, one was tech, one was minimal, yeah. and they all and each tracks uh, each track charted separately. Wow, in, uh, top fifty. Each. Crazy. Yeah, Bport. Yeah. Fuck. Is that right? Is that about right? Yeah, Anything right. uh, else you want to add to that? <laughs> one got into the top ten out of those. Nice. That was, that was, that was real nice. But yeah, that's to, a good uh, feeling. Uh, it was amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, organic and everything yeah, too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's uh, techno, right? You're making techno? Yeah. Uh, or or more mean, house I or like, what? I like all music, but yeah. uh, techno, tech house, minimal, yeah. deep tech. I mean. Yeah, deep tech is a, um, a genre that I didn't really even realize uh, was a thing. Um, and I don't know if it's just more popular like recently, but uh, how would you describe it uh, if you had to um, describe it's, it? It's really like uh, it could be a mixture of techno and tech mm-hmm. house, mm-hmm. Uh, but it's it's definitely more stripped back. Interesting. Um, there are way more layers going on though, so uh, yeah, um, it's it's a nice sound. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not as repetitive as like your typical four on the floor, like you know techno or right. house music in general. Right. Uh, pull that mic for mic a little bit closer to you too. Sorry. You can you can grab the whole stand if that's easier. You're asking for a deep tech, right? Deep. Uh, that's true. Oh, about, right? deep. No. Uh, the, uh, or tech. minimal. <clears throat> what was it? See, the deep tech is one. And yeah. There's also minimal, which is totally oh, right. different. Okay. Right? Yes. Yeah. So minimal is what does that refer that's, to? Is that more? That's I what think you that's were what describing. He was referring to yeah. Yeah, but they're actually uh, now kind of. Uh, the same thing in the same genre same, yeah like okay if you were to look on beatport yeah they took away just minimal as a uh, as a genre and they changed hmm. it to minimal deep tech oh interesting yeah, they kind of put was, them t- together yeah yeah uh, to kind of maybe shrink the pool i'm guessing right maybe if they didn't have enough releases on both of them they're like well we'll just put them together and you yeah. know get get more uh, that's cool um, so what uh, what kind of like did you because uh, I'm, I'm so new to that genre like where do you pull from to get do you literally like listen to like your deep your, your tech house stuff and then also techno and then you just kind of combine the yeah so when I'm shopping for music I mean I've I've got certain filters mm-hmm. so if I want to just shop for one genre um, I could just say okay uh, I've got a techno gig coming up I just want to only look for techno. Yeah, And then right. just all the labels and artists I follow that are, you know, in the techno genre will pop up. Right, okay. So, nice. um, you know, same thing. It's like if I just, if it's going to be a tech house or if I'm just shopping in general just to hear what's out, you yeah. know, no filter. Yeah, no filter. <laughs> <laughs> no filter. <laughs> That's my filter. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So what are you using to, to produce again? Uh, I'm on Ableton. Ableton, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's what I use as well. Yeah. Seems like most people in electronic music are Ableton or Logic. Logic and Ableton. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sometimes Reason a little bit. You Reason. Know. Uh, the yeah. bigger bigger guys like uh, 
hip hop. I think Pro Tools is. Like, yeah, Pro Tools is popular for hip hop. I'm yeah. not really sure why. Yeah. Um, it was kind of always the studio industry standard. That might have something to do with it, you know, um, because I think you know electronic musicians have always been working more or less out of their own like home studio. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, of course, you don't need the industry standard. You want something that, uh, you know, Ableton and, and Logic, to me, have always been a little more creative. Yeah. Um, you know, like with uh, Ableton's, you know, uh, effects and just, it's just, it's always seemed like a like a kind of playground for producing versus, uh, I open up Pro Tools and it feels kind of sterile like a doctor's office or something, you know. Yeah, but, I've, uh, I've hmm. mainly done Ableton, uh, I messed around on uh, Logic like mm-hmm. once or twice and... It, <clears throat> Very different. Very, yeah, very different, right? <laughs> very yeah, different, different workflow. Almost, yeah, it's yeah. felt like I had to go through some extra steps yeah. to do certain things. I'm like, really? Yeah. So. Am I mistaken? Is Lo- was Logic out before Ableton? I don't know. What, uh, Did you know that one? I'm not sure. I kind of so think it was. Yeah, yeah. It might have been. So Logic used to be owned by eMagic. <clears throat> um, I think eMagic, and then eventually got bought out by uh, Apple. And then they, of course, you know, okay. said that was kind of their... They had uh, GarageBand, and then the upgraded version is Logic. Um, and then I think Ableton has kind of, yeah, kind of started. I don't know. It'd be, uh, I'm interested to n- now know which one uh, yeah. came first. Yeah, so I had a headliner from Spain here a couple of times named uh, Romero Lopez, mm-hmm. and uh, he's been producing for yeah, ages. Mm-hmm. And I'm pretty sure that's what he said, hmm. is that he's on Log- Logic because that's what he started with and yeah. before Ableton came out. And right. he did try to switch to Ableton, but he was already so... Um, um, in control of logic and understands logic so well that, but yeah. he did say he did tell me that for people who are getting started, he does recommend Ableton better though. Yeah, Ableton yeah. more, yeah, more user yeah. friendly. I can see it. Well, and also the price mm-hmm. point too is like when you get into Pro Tools, a lot of times you know that well, for a long time there they were you know you had to you had to buy their hardware to go with it you know whereas like Ableton or Logic or whatever you kind of yeah, use you whatever got all these other interface. VSTs you can use and right. You're not bound to their. Yeah, and even just being able to use VSTs versus RTAS or, or AU plugins or whatever, um, that opens up a whole other world. And that's kind of why I use like a, like a PC versus Mac, because if you're using VSTs and a PC, you have like a, like a universe of plugins you can use, all kind of like little homemade, you know, things, and it just kind of opens you up to a, a bigger, um, uh, you know, opportunity pool as far as like what you're working with creatively, you know what I mean? Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I wanted to ask uh, ask you guys. You know, uh, you've been doing parties for as long as I can remember, um, and I kind of wanted to. You know, I, I've ne- I think we've always, you know, hung out and stuff, but it's always yeah. been the party, and I've never been gotten the chance to like ask you like, how did you get started mm-hmm. in the music industry and and DJing? Yeah, so um, I started off, started off as a promoter, mm-hmm. um, probably about two thousand six. Um, in San Jose mm-hmm. and uh, and Pleasanton. Remember we were talking about Aura, the yeah, nightclub? Yeah, right. So actually I was, a, my first promotion, you know, I don't say gig, but the p- promotion work was actually at Aura mm-hmm. um, with uh, with a friend named Jessica. So she had parties over there, house music. They were bringing Donald Glad and everything like that back in those days. Wow. So I came was this like 2006? Uh, 2005, 2006. 2005? Okay. Yeah, 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 wow. yeah, yeah, a long Crazy. time ago. So I mm-hmm. uh, learned a lot from her, from her you know, um, mm-hmm. guest list blast. Yeah. Things like that, promotions. Uh, back then, that was the MySpace days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bulletins and everything. <laughs> yeah, how did, how did that work? That was going to be another one of my questions. Like, Yeah, how- I think MySpace for promos uh, kind of went flat because people started figuring out how to uh, hack and bought the uh, bulletin boards, and then it just got oh, flooded, right. so everybody was just tired of it. Yeah, yeah MySpace but- was full of, like, all kinds of hacking. I mean, yeah, they, yeah. You know, even just the... The more uh, this is one thing I did like about MySpace was, you know, with the whole like glitter emojis and the fucking personalization it was like, of the pages. It was, it was, yeah. I mean, you go to some people's pages and it was just like AIDS. It was like over. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> it'd be like autoplay music and like all these glitter like, icons and like, yeah, like like all kinds of crazy oh, shit find going the on. Top right corner, mute it. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that that was a that was an interesting time. And now you look at something like Facebook and it's so contained and streamlined and and i guess in that aspect it's uh it's better you know what i mean yeah, yeah, um, yeah. but i did like that people could in theory that you could customize your own page because that at a, at a time where people were just kind of getting into like the internet and social media like it gave your average person like you know becky becky the secretary all of a sudden wants to learn html code <laughs> yeah. so she can like you know like pimp out her page you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then I did know a lot of people that, di that didn't understand that and they felt left out. So they wouldn't uh, even want to yeah. be on MySpace because they felt like they couldn't get the page up. You I can know? see that. So yeah. it's kind of like, you know, leaving people out type right. thing. Right. Or you got to like, you got to go pay some, some guy yeah, to yeah, pimp yeah. out your page. You know? <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. So I do see why people like the Facebook because it's all, you know, same platform, all, all leveled out. Mm -hmm, you know, everybody mm -hmm. has the same page type thing. So yeah. Definitely more. Um, more streamlined. It just feels, uh, you know, it's more. I, I have my own opinions about Facebook, and I pretty much just these days use it for, you know, getting a hold of people and and uh, you know promoting things I'm into. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. So like, how how do you find uh, promo with? Uh, so, and, and we'll we'll come back to your because I know we're kind of tangential. You know, we're going into a oh, tangent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, as far as like promo and stuff on uh, Facebook and social media, how do you find it? Uh, you know, in 2019. Yeah, so um, I actually just started getting into ads, which actually help out quite oh, a bit. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, a couple of years ago, so Facebook has an has an ad uh, platform, of course, which mm -hmm. I'm sure some other promoters know about. Yep. But uh, you can target your ad to certain people in a, in a specific area, mm -hmm. as well as who they follow and what they're listening to. Right. So you can, uh, yeah, target these ads nice. um, um, uh, pretty closely to your to your audience. Yeah. Yeah, that it's seems like a, a good way to go because it's uh, again kind of more. I mean, you can you can get you know you can get uh, what are they, the, the uh, analytics on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so you're not just throwing this thing out into the universe and being like, oh, well, I hope people saw it, you know, and they're like, <laughs> show up, who what, saw What it? kind of people saw right, it? Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you can narrow down the age and everything. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. So and you can get some cool. tangential feedback mm -hmm. and be like, okay, I know that this worked well. Um, yeah. You can tweak it for, you know, future, future use, shows. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, keep uh, keep going. With yeah, your, and then you know. uh, another huge thing, uh, which were which I was late on. I wish I got into it before, but mm -hmm. was creating my own uh, guest list uh, or guest um, guest list. Um, Blast going. Oh, you know? right. So yeah. uh, email We're talking list. email and text. Yeah, email and, list. Well, yeah. email list, I should have got a long time ago. Uh, right. But we're working on that now. Yeah. Uh, same thing with a text text list as well. Yeah. Those are huge, uh, huge tools uh, for promo. Yeah. Yeah, email's a weird one because I always just thought that was kind of a waste of time. And I think maybe a lot of people do think that, but it's been proven to, like, not be a waste of time. Yeah, people absolutely. actually do click on it. And, you know, I've, I've been getting... Uh, Christian Panero's uh, emails for you know like a pro over a decade now and you know it's good yeah. what it does is it keeps you in that person's mind even if you're not reading every single one of them or whatever yeah speaking um, of which with Christian yeah so Christian yeah. and uh, Robot Ears John Cabrera I've been looking up to them for a while as mm. as promoters and yeah they use email blast you know they do have a text blast but mm -hmm. you know they use that for when needed and you know text blast is kind of intrusive in a little bit you know so yeah. you yeah. only use it when you really need it you yeah. know but uh, yeah big promoters like that are using email blast yeah you know? Christian's got some I, I, I think this is Christian's <laughs> email list, but um, it, it always comes up with the same format once you click in. But he's got it so it like changes the name every time it sends you one. So I'll like I'll read something <laughs> and I'm like I click and I open. It, I'm like oh motherfucker, you got me <laughs> got again. Me. Like, <laughs> got him. <laughs> <Got> him. <laughs> that's like, it's a good. It's a good. Uh, see, those guys like that stay one step ahead of you. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it's <laughs> a good move. What service is that? Right. Yeah. Let <laughs> me <laughs> note this down. Talk to him about this. One. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> So, but yeah, there's cool. a, lot of, a lot of good tools like that, you know. Yeah. And then Mioli, too, of course. Yeah, they have an amazing text blast. You know? Nice. So uh, email blast and text blast is something yeah. uh, that every promoter should start working on, yeah. Yeah. And so, then so from from there, uh, you know, you started getting your own guest list together and promo yeah. list. And then... Um, and then how do you, how did you get into kind of like starting your own shows, your own events? And yeah, so uh, I think we left off um, over in Pleasanton. That's where we left yeah, off at. Yeah, yeah. 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 So um, through through that promoter, uh, I started meeting um, promoters in San Jose and San Francisco because mm -hmm. she was connected to other promoters, and they just started bringing me on as hosts and promoters. And I kind of kind of always had a large, pretty group of friends that would come out and party, some yeah. good partiers, you know. Right. So um, I'd bring them out, and then uh, little by little, I started uh, being a bigger promoter on these events. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 2010, oh no, excuse me, 2009, I uh, was given a residency as a promoter at Harlot. That was my first where oh, we met. Yeah, um, right. But I had that for just over a year. Um, but during that time at Harlot, that's when I was like, you know what? I really want to be a DJ. Like, man, I like mm. booking these DJs. And I've always been in house and techno since, yeah, since the year two, 2000, actually. Yeah, my first right. rave. Um, so I've always, like, downloaded music, mm -hmm. made CDs for people, given them out. You know, and I was like, yeah. oh, man, I always want to be a DJ. And then... I had run into my buddy uh, from uh, 2099, who had been DJing since 95, Juan, Juan Beats. Um, oh, yeah, I know yeah, Juan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I ran it, we, we kind of reconnected, and and uh, during my Harlot, Harlot parties, and he used to always be my opener for the oh, Harlot right. parties. He's open every one. I have Juan Beats on the podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man, yeah. He's got some, <laughs> some stories, great experience sure. and yeah. stories, yeah, from yeah. Rays and everything. But um, I... Uh, 
Oh yeah, so I hit him up. I was like, hey man. Oh, so he was DJing. I was like, hey, you know what? How about you know you just teach me how to DJ? Is that cool? He goes, yeah, for sure. So he taught me how to DJ. So uh, and I was still hosting other parties at this time throughout San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And um, at that point, I told all these uh, bigger promoters, Christian, Arash of Mirza Parties, um, Vadik, and everybody. I said, you know what? Thanks for you know having me as host before. But now, mm-hmm. if you want me to help out with your party, gotta book me as a DJ. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's what happened. So that's when nice. I switched from a pro- promoter to DJ. Sick. And I, it kind of it helped out because I kind of already had a following. And yeah. hate to say it, but you know a lot of these a lot of those pr- pr- uh, promoters uh, they want somebody to at least bring a small group of people. Yeah, right. You know, so yeah. it kind of already got my foot in the door that I was already able to bring people because I was a promoter and right. uh, yeah they just kept booking me for yeah. uh, for parties and then eventually just started um, um, doing parties here and there uh, with Chris Zuniga of course mm-hmm. so we started uh, the, the label Funky Technomics not the label but the group um, yeah. in uh, 2000 uh, 13, actually. Yeah, yeah, 2013. Right. So it actually started off as an internet radio show. Yeah, that's coming, right. Coming yeah, out of Temple, if you remember that. Yeah. So Chris was offered a, a slot for a radio show, yeah. and uh, we did it. And we had guests. We did some live mixing. And then they uh, Temple shut down the uh, radio booth mm. uh, to expand uh, for the for the building. And uh, we're like, man, what are we going to do, man? We've been doing great. This is fun. Right. <laughs> so we actually just flipped it into parties. You know, we started yeah. we started off with the San Francisco uh, tour in which we had Cellar and some other parties and then yeah, in which yeah. we had you, DJ. Yep. So just by that. Cellar. What, what is the Cellar now? Is it? Uh, I don't think it's been anything, actually, since it closed just down. closed down, yeah. yeah. remember? I think it had that shooting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's what yeah, happened. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, but uh, Paul, who owned it, uh, he, he's, he's doing other things, though. Okay. Well, yeah. well, that's good. So, I, I like that. I, I like that spot because, uh, which is also why I liked uh, Slide. I like any place that you go downstairs and you're like kind of underground. You know, literally, yeah. He likes the underground. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't right. we all? <laughs> yeah. It always just reminded me of this, like, uh, I don't know, it always felt like this kind of like New York y thing where, like, you know, like you go down to like see a comedy show or some, you know, rave or whatever. And it's, you know, going downstairs always made it more like kind of uh, literally legit. speakeasy type of thing. Literally, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Slide was a cool spot too. They had that slide. It was, uh, for anyone that don't know, don't know there's a, a nightclub called Slide right next to and also owned by uh, Ruby Sky mm-hmm. and there was like a slide that right when you walked in you could go down <laughs> and I, I think that they probably due to like you know potential lawsuits and stuff I they think close they, it they close it off it's just like well, drunk girls yeah. no skirt like, yeah, right. on the chin rug, rug burn <laughs> <laughs> rug burn on the cheeks loud noise going down uh, yes, but yeah, yes. But no, it, was, shrieks. It, yeah. it was fun though yeah it was fun there everybody, I would have everybody go down there the first time yeah right but yeah we did parties there we did parties at Supper Club yeah remember Supper Club yeah uh, Supper Michael, Club Michael Anthony dude, used to run Supper Club was sick mm-hmm. I remember I I, I, uh, I spun a, a foam party at Supper Club oh what and they literally I think I did hear but I remember the yeah, they yeah, literally yeah. like they hung uh, like clear plastic around the whole like dance floor, and I was DJing through a little like cutout window <laughs> in the plastic, and there's like foam splashing at me and shit. And I'm like, what the fuck? This is so wild. And there's chicks in on bikinis and stuff, and it felt like a little piece of like Miami or something, like <laughs> mid December. Like, uh, MTV jams. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> MTV Beach House. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Summer Club had some amazing parties. That was yeah. definitely an icon for sure. For yeah. San Francisco for a long time. And it was such a San Francisco club too because they had the the uh, like beds. Yeah. Like the whole thing was these All white beds. All beds around Which got a little gross after a while. But <laughs> right. like, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how can they wash those sheets? Yeah, right. <laughs> but I think just flip they... Just it over. Yeah, just flip it again, right. <laughs> the cool side of the pillow. Yeah, the cool side. Yeah. <laughs> but I, yeah, I think they did a lot of uh, kind of little bit like uh you know like lingerie kind of like kinkier things too there when it wasn't the kind of the normal yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like like nightclub well yeah yeah their dinners club. were kind of kinky like that so that's what yeah that's what kicked it out yeah the like, like having someone strip while you're like getting having dinners and yeah, all that. yeah 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 during supper literally you'd have you know you know naked uh contortionists and right, things like that right. you know which so. I, I think uh is asia sf is that kind of the same thing i've never actually been into asia so i've actually never been either yeah uh, yeah but no it's uh, just cross dressers yeah okay cross dressers yeah uh, 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 dancing and then uh, so dinner and show and, yeah. and everything uh, yeah i heard good things about it yeah from yeah. everyone so yeah I been yeah that one's been around for a long time too. yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah, like totally. uh, I mean, just I always pass by it. I'm like, oh, I gotta check it out someday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, what about you, man? What's uh, what's? How did you get into uh, DJing and, and break into the the scene? Kind of. It's a real story. Um, wow. So, '98. Uh, wow. 1998. Yeah. Uh, so out of the group, he's the longest. Yeah, I was still in high school. Longest, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that I was actually a junior in high school. Oh, good. Okay. So oh, so we're about the same you, age. Gives you a. a Yeah, right, yeah. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so uh, I had a good buddy, uh, actually, uh, Jeremy. 
Jeremy Habib. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, he had turntables at his house, and uh, you know he was like DJing like like parties and stuff. And I'm like, hey man, like, what is it? What are you doing? <laughs> right. <laughs> like, what is that? He he showed me the basics, just like how to beat match, and yeah, I think I was like three or four hours by myself just on the decks. Like yeah. the first time he showed me, just trying it out right. but uh he actually uh taught me how to play uh, i was a hip-hop dj at first nice so started with hip-hop and uh then you know it was like house and hip-hop and then uh yeah like house music was just prominent yeah after that and um yeah those were the days record shopping uh, was in a record pool i mean it was a different time back then right when you actually had to go to record stores to <clears throat> check out music and that sort of thing and yeah yeah and, uh, uh, much more expensive yes right yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely you're spending uh, eight bucks to, to buy one track sometimes Jesus. You know? yeah uh, domestic and it's like oh well there's three or four tracks on this this ep but mm -hmm. uh i like one of them right <laughs> Yeah, there's DJs today yeah. that uh, that are worried about paying for the waves, you know, an extra dollar. Yeah, right. And yeah. these experienced DJs have been playing. Yeah, yeah. And then you have an the imported, yeah. imported piece of wax, and, you know, right. you're <laughs> 13, Man. bucks. And you would have to just, you'd have to go and, and just, like, in little bits, unless you, like, saved up and got these large chunks where you could buy, like, oh, you know, man, I'd, 10 I'd albums have, or whatever, but, like. I'd spend paychecks sometimes. I'd go in there and be like, I'd have to put stuff back. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> you do like these like, buy and oh, buy and trade shit, you oh, know, like two hundred dollars on records. Oh, right. man. <laughs> How much do I really like this track? Yeah. You know, then like, you then it's really the yeah. let me go back and listen to these. Right. Three well, that's, times over. Yeah, yeah. Well that <laughs> was narrowed down to like, you know, five or six records. I mean, yeah, not just uh, not just, you know, technology, but like that was a very real limiting factor as to like who could be a DJ was like, did, were you invested enough to like put money forth and practice and save up and get a pair of turntables and that sort of thing? You know, um, it was a, yeah, that's funny you say that. I mean, yeah. I, uh, as a teenager, you know, well, that's, that's probably 16 or 17 year old when I started. Mm -hmm. Um, I pieced my setup with my own money, Yeah. you know, as a teenager and right. I, I can say this, you know, being happy about it, but I started with, the correct setup yeah <laughs> i bought technique 1200s nice. I bought a good mixer yeah. i had i mean sound was not as important then, but yeah. you know the to drop you know 1500 bucks two thousand bucks for a, a teenage kid right well especially when you're just doing uh you're doing yeah, house parties like, you know what i mean like, like yeah bedroom dj yeah i say to anybody you know you're not gonna get unless you make it to the top one percent mm. no you're not doing this for the return on investment it's yeah only for the love for the passion right you know, it's, it's what you do but yeah Absolutely. yeah back then there's a lot of a lot of weeding out you know it took a lot yeah. a lot more time just to learn how to dj right you know so i mean people are learning how to dj in the you know in weeks yeah. you know but the, these experienced guys took months how to learn you right. know how to dj yeah you know, vinyls was, how to set up your needles everything yeah and i you was <laughs> i hung out with a pretty <clears throat> great bunch of djs i'll just say that and it was yeah. like you know back then when you'd go out it was just everybody was so crucial on your skill set so right like i didn't even play out for the longest time because like just like my immediate peers it was just like ha you're train wrecking yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're train wrecking is going off you know it was just like it's like you go to a party as a dj it's like yeah. you're not you're not going to dance you're just like let's see what this guy's got yeah right <laughs> i yeah. mean that's how it was back then yeah now it's it's very different now but that's yeah you know that was kind yeah. of the dj culture back then well it, i think that's what like also made you get good too is like it was almost as like like you were a bunch of like skaters and you're going out to the skate park or something and you're gotta like keep you know, up you gotta keep up you know you gotta <laughs> dude's doing doing kick flips over like five stairs you gotta be able to you know yeah. do something similar like yeah so, yeah i was uh different times back then yeah yeah <laughs> yeah a lot of limiting fa factors a lot of ways to weed out weed out the people who's going to be real djs right back then. even when i was in college like uh you know djs uh you know there were cdjs weren't really even a thing it's like you had to have turntables that was i think maybe a couple years after that cdjs came out um but people were still you know throwing parties with you know turntables and all that um and i, I remember my i had a i had a, a roommate in uh in in college it kind of before I even got into the idea of it had ruined the idea of being a DJ for me <laughs> because he would we'd throw these parties and he like he was a great dude he just had terrible taste in music and he would you know get all fucked up and he would be like the last person awake at six in the morning still scratching <laughs> 
up like just super high. Just <laughs> and I was like, oh, DJ suck, dude. DJ suck. This is the worst. <laughs> Trying to sleep and shit, you know. Um, but uh, then once I, you know, moved back down here and I started going out and really seeing, you know, the music scene here. And I was like, oh, like, this is what DJing is. This, it's not that, you know, that's, I guess, maybe one version of it. But like, you know, um, then it was like, then I was like, this is, this is actually pretty, this is pretty fucking cool, you know. Yeah. Um, especially in San Francisco too, and I, I you know, I, I, I think every city, probably major metro area, has their own flavor of it. You know, a New York DJ versus uh, LA, San Francisco, Chicago but DJ or... Chicago, yeah. Um, but I, I really do. I feel like San Francisco has such like a healthy music scene, and like we could go to any you know uh, festival or street fair or party or whatever, and I run into all the same people I know. You know, I run into you all the time. You <laughs> know what I mean? Um, and now that I'm working here, it's just like I see all my friends like all the time, and uh, it's it's good. Yeah, you know, no, House has definitely so, stepped the game up for sure. Absolutely, yeah. There is so much talent in the Bay Area, in yeah. San Francisco. I mean, it's I can't count how many parties I've gone to where it's like, you know, where I'm like, man, I actually like the opening DJ set better than the headliner. Yeah. You know, I, I can't even keep track. I mean, it's, there's a ton of talent here. Yes. And it's just, a lot of it's untapped too. Right. There's so many people that don't even get that opportunity and they've got mad Yeah, skills. totally. Right. Um, but yeah, San Francisco is, uh, I, I think, a very unique scene. Yeah. I think we're spoiled too. Um, I, I moved up to Sacramento for about a year. And I realized very quickly, and I thought, oh, no big deal. I'll go to the bars and clubs. There. And it's all top 40 up there, which is, you know, I can enjoy it to a certain degree, but year round, you know, not really. Um, but I realized that, you know, we're spoiled here because up there, you know, the, the biggest thing that happened was like Dada Life came and played in some warehouse, which <laughs> well, the guy was too ravey for me, you know. Uh, Justin Martin came, uh, Cats and Dogs okay. came. That was like two out of the entire year, you know, that I was really excited about. And even then it was, it was a club that was smaller than, than, than Halcyon. Um, and, you know, down here you could, on a Wednesday night, Skrillex might show up at the Bill Graham or, you know, or like, you know, we have big, big names coming in here all the time. No, you know, you know, you're spoiled when you, when you have a night and you're like, which party should I go to? Like, <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. When you have four you know, or five like, of the best venues, yeah. they all have so, some international talent that you like. like right. Yeah. 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 What do I do? You're torn. Do I, do I, like, do I skip it halfway through and Uber <laughs> over to the next place? Oh, you know, like, I have friends. That's, that's, yeah. You like, yeah. you know, that's it's kind of like you got a rave running stage to stage between. You yeah. Know, right. It's like, it's almost like, like San Francisco is like a little mini festival. <laughs> yeah, right? Festivals. You're like, I'll go to this stage for the first run over the other yeah, stage. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be here for an hour. Okay, uh, but we don't. I don't want to miss this guy's set. Guess right. Yeah. Guess as close as that. So and so. Yes. We gotta make Hold it for on, last. Let me see if I can get us in. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I had any advice for people, don't do that on New Year's Eve because it will end up terribly. <laughs> <laughs> you will not get in on the second no, place you go. Pay for New Year's yeah. Eve. No. Yeah. No, right. Or DJ get in for free. That too. That too. But yeah, not totally spoiled. Yeah, last especially the last few years. Yeah. Um, the especially for underground music. I mean, the, oh, the lineups, the bookings have been yeah. going through the roof. With of course, Halcyon really put it on the map. You know, yeah. San Francisco, but also Great Northern Monarch has really been stepping up their game. Right. Too, right. Know? Not even stepping up their game. Great Northern's pretty new. Well, know, they, they they rent but they re, yeah. revamped it. It was uh, well. it was mighty before. Yep. I love what they did to that oh, place. It's amazing. Like yeah, the, yeah. the projection mapping and the the whole like. Uh, kind of retro uh like flapper vibe mixed with like 2019 like technology it's yeah, really void sound system. really cool yeah. yeah void sound system which has like they have like leds in it yeah yeah, yeah. like these you know the speakers are shaped like horns i mean right just, you know yeah, yeah the whole thing is sick yeah yeah yeah, no, people were waiting for and kind of begging for Mighty to uh, to upgrade and, yeah. you know, re renovate. I remember we, yeah. you know, I, I go there a lot, you know, and you just hear people, man, they need to upgrade this place. Yeah, my bathrooms well, were pretty bad, too. And finally they shut down. They came yeah. back and blew everyone's mind. Oh, yeah. they, they put new bathrooms in, and those bathrooms are sick. Yeah, yeah. The bathrooms, I think, uh, I don't remember what it was that what, I, I, they had something that, oh, was it? They have like screens in front of the urinals or, or something there. It was like I remember walking in there and be like, "Holy shit, this is impressive." What were they playing on the screens? I don't know. I don't remember. Yeah, <laughs> some hub. Yeah, right. <laughs> DJ hub. Yeah, right. 
<laughs> but uh, yeah, no, they blew everybody's minds when they came out with this, and uh, yeah. yeah, and then Halcyon came out the maps and yeah. came out of left field with uh, their, their dub fire and uh, oh, dub fire and that one night. Yeah. yeah, it was like the third, fourth week, but man, they really just put it, like, started putting things on the what, map. Yeah. What, those names are here and they're on the same bill. What the? Right, yeah, yeah, right. So, yeah, yeah we've jumped in the deep end. Last know? few years, we've been crazy spoiled over here. Yeah, I must say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is a good a good place, and I, I I feel like I kind of fell into this, and I got you know uh, the the I got connected with everyone here just kind of randomly, but uh, and I had never even been here, um, but I was kind of aware that it was like it was dope. I just kept hearing mm-hmm. like these really good things about it, um, and and you know I, I kind of feel like you know just like everyone always says like you can like good things happen for a reason and just kind of unexpectedly. You know you can try to like make things happen a lot of times, and sometimes good shit just falls into your lap and you're like or sick yeah. yeah organic right yeah. right not uh, not forced yeah happy um, for you <clears throat> yeah thanks man um and this kind of is a good segue too because one of my questions was i was i was i wanted to ask you guys um my, my roommate actually uh brought this up um earlier and, and we were talking about you know local talent versus uh big names you know he was he was kind of feeling like um, that you know, a lot of parties, or he feels like a lot of parties might not do well necessarily unless there is a big name on the list, right? Um, and then a lot of you know local talent doesn't get to kind of shine quite as much. Like like let's say you threw a night that was just local talent, it might not do quite as well as if uh, you know Yours Vorn or uh, you know some some big name DJ showed up. Well, I, I mean I know in San Francisco we have a really healthy scene here and so there's no shortage of local DJs yeah, being yeah. able to play um, but like what are your what are your guys thoughts on that yeah no we've we've done parties that are just locals yeah. you know yeah. um, but in those mindsets we're not really trying to you know pack up a halcyon or trying to pack up you know a great northern yeah you know but we know we can do a successful party um, yeah. um, with locals nice. you know and we have you know we've done it before so um, you're not feeling pressure to have like a big name yeah on, uh, yeah no so yeah. Um, I, yeah, we don't feel pressured for that, yeah. but every now and then we do want to do big events like. Yeah, um, it kind of mm. makes it stand out a little more, <clears throat> um, you know, especially if you spread them out and you know you've got that big name we're able right. to bring in. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're trying to pack a place um, that's a large venue, you know, larger venue like Halcyon and whatnot, mm. uh, you you probably would need a need a headliner. Yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of these local guys have great followings, you know. Um, totally. But when you think about a headliner coming to a city, they have, you know, thousands of followers in that city. Yes. You know, just thousands, just because they're a headliner, yeah. you know. Right. So once you put them on the bill, people hear about it, you're, you're, people are coming that you've never even met, that none of the DJs have ever met, you know. Yeah. So if you're trying to pack a place, you definitely do want to kind of have a headliner. Sure. We're starting to do uh, quarterly events, which is what I was talking about, the breakers. So mm-hmm. on those ones, we're definitely bringing international DJs so we yeah. can... You know, fill up places like Halcyon or the Great Northern and things like that, partnering right. up with other promoters. Yeah. Uh, but no, it's definitely people can definitely do a local local party and make yeah. it successful yeah. with locals, and we have, and we will we'll be continuing to do that. The as town's right. definitely yeah. there. That's not an issue. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah. and I think too, uh, you know, uh, it's kind of situational, right? Like if you were to try to pack out like a Saturday night here at Halcyon, like you kind of have to have a, a, a big name on it, right? But if you're throwing like a day party at the end up or whatever, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Or you're doing like like a like a pool party, or poolside Har- party, or, or a night at Harlan, or night at Harlan. Yeah, 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 you're right, yeah. You know, even on the weekend, you could do locals. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's kind of situational. And and I mean, uh, you know, more to your point, I, I I feel like there's so many times where I'll go to uh, you know a show and I like the headliner even or the, the 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 openers even more than the headliner. Um, you know, just I, I, maybe because they're 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 from here, and so they they know kind of what the the, the San Francisco people really like. You know, yeah, I, yeah. I actually very much agree with that. Yeah, um, I, I tell people all the time. I, I think uh, our audience here in San Francisco, um, they want a certain thing. Yeah, uh, they really do, and um, there's a certain thing that uh, makes them tick right. on the dance floor, right. and. You know, headliner could be the most talented person in the world, um, and that's why they're here. But sometimes their vision, they're just not able to talk to the audience. Yeah. So I, I really yeah. feel like uh, SF has a very uh, unique crowd right. uh, that uh, we have to cater to. Yes. <laughs> well, and we are we are kind of music snobs here yeah, to a certain no, degree. Yeah, we very much so. Yeah, I mean, I, I've heard people uh, like like. Uh, I've heard people be like, oh, he played this track. And I'm like, wow, really? <laughs> like, like, yeah, actually, you, you it amazes me. <laughs> You're offended. Uh, <laughs> it really amazes me how um, so many non-DJs mm. know tracks by title and mm-hmm. by producer. And label. Like, they label, know these, yeah. like, 
it's like, damn, I'm a DJ and um, I don't even know who you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Aside from talented like, opening DJs, there's yeah, people out there in the crowd the that crowd. know more music than most, you know, a lot right. of locals, right. local, yeah. di- local DJs. Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it people in the crowd me. are like, I had that four years ago. <laughs> <laughs> you still playing that track? <laughs> but hey, house of techno music is timeless. Yes. You play a ten-year-old track and. You can still get the same reaction from when it was first released. Yeah, but Absolutely. In, in yeah. those people's defense, though, like it goes back to you know we've been spo- yeah. we've been spoiled, so we've seen all these great DJs bringing out yeah. all this new music. Yeah. And then when you do hear a headliner playing something that might be older, then you're kind of like, oh really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the other headliner played that two years ago. <laughs> right. <you know? laughs> right. Playing those so, uh, the, the playing those older tracks too is like, it's it's kind of like this thing where w- once it reaches a certain age or, or enough time has passed, because at one point it was probably rinsed out you know by all the djs that were playing it you know mm-hmm. um like I, I feel like if someone hears like i don't know like lose it by fisher or something or some 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 <laughs> classic track of 2019 mm-hmm. you hear it in five or ten years and you're kind of like oh like it it, it strikes a chord because it kind of brings you back to that that it, place it that you were at you yeah, know yeah, yeah. I, I i try to incorporate you know some older tracks in my mm-hmm. sets and uh, especially if I know I have like a, 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 you know some buddies that are here yeah. and they're like you know like you're gonna know this track and it's like right it's like Easter know, egg yeah no <laughs> it, it really is and it's like you know and then like going back to me not playing out uh, in my early days it's like mm-hmm. you know some tracks I'm like man I, I wish I could hear this on a loud system mm-hmm. yeah, right. and then it's just like it's you know it's, yeah but it's there's a win-win <laughs> yeah yeah there's some huge tracks so like 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 you know um, that one by Fisher you know it's big and right now everybody mm-hmm. some of us would be like man kind of over it you know yeah but give it a give it you know five years or more if somebody plays them like oh wow you yeah, know right. but even for the next two three years people are still gonna be like wow you still playing that yeah. you know so there's kind of yeah. I feel like it's kind of got to be a buffer between these classic tracks when we play them again. You know, Absolutely. Once they die out, get rinsed out. Give it some time. You yeah. Know, yeah. I, I went or, to. Uh, or don't shop on the top 100. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that'll <laughs> help too, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, do some digging. Uh, you know? yeah. I, I, yeah, it just takes a lot of a lot of research to make sure it's not. Yeah. Top 100. Right. right. Yeah, yeah. You gotta so, have you gotta have your sources. You know, your your special well, places. Yeah, you set look. it aside and wait a week or two and right. go back and check. Yeah. This this track sounds really good. It's probably going to be popular. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So in the DJ group, we talk about it. We're like, we, we say, you know, we, we all, none of us ever go out to the, you know, the top 100 or whatever mm-hmm. just to look for music. Mm-hmm. You know, we already ha- already have our own following of artist labels that we yeah. look, that we filter through. Um, but uh, also we talk about, you know, let's let's make sure let's check on the track that we're downloading, making sure, yeah. you know, it wasn't released, you know, a year, year and a half ago. Right. Because uh, Beatport regurgitates. Yeah. Oh, they music do. That's and right. Because different labels will buy it and then they'll re-release it. So you'll yeah. go to a song and then you'll download it, you know, and then you might hear like, wait, or you might see it somewhere else and then realize it was already uh, released a year, year and a half I've, ago. I've oh. actually done that where I bought a track couple times and I've already had it. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. This track is sick. I've heard it somewhere. <laughs> yeah. And it's then in... it's like, oh, that's because I bought it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's what I tell you know, new DJs. If you're going to buy a track on, on Beatport, mm-hmm. just do a quick search on there. Yeah. Make sure it wasn't re-released before because it'll show you all the dates it was released. You Interesting. Know? So a quick way just to see if it was released before. Yeah. Just do a research of that song in Beatport and it'll show you all the release dates yeah. of that. That way you know if it, if it was released last year, two right. years ago, three years, you know. Yeah. Good way of doing that. Yeah. But, if you like it, it's okay. Yeah. yeah. If you like it, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. If it's good music. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's why everyone uh, starts DJing and continues DJing is because they have good taste in music, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I think there's a, maybe a little bit of a difference between like how well does that resonate? And I kinda, that's what makes you a good DJ is how well does that resonate with other people? You know what I mean? And then you start getting into the things where it's like, Oh, this part. Once you start impressing other DJs, and you're yeah, like, yeah. "Oh, I had this. I know that track. <laughs> so that's exactly. I know I look for this track hella hard, and you have it. Like that's sick." Yeah, you know? I've been in the club before, and uh, and I hear a DJ playing something. I'm like, "Wow, I played. I played that last year." Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, and it doesn't really knock them, but you're kind of like, "Wow, I played that." And I yeah. and I get some, you know, you know, a little uh, self conscious when I'm downloading music mm-hmm. or when I'm playing something. Like. Is there a DJ out there that already heard the song? Yeah, yeah like, right. <laughs> yeah. You know, so for me, it's kind of like I don't want to be playing something that somebody, you know, especially a DJ that's already heard or yes. play, let alone play. Yeah. You know, so. yeah. That was like such a no-no back in the day. Like, if he loved a track, it was like, nah, I have that track. Yeah. Oh, I can't buy it. <laughs> yeah. oh, I really like it, though. I want it. And there's some DJs. Like, some... such a stigma to that. <laughs> right. And, and, and now some, there's some DJs, your friends, they'll be like, oh, I got that track. Right. <laughs> like, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't play like I can. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I, love, <laughs> I love the tracks that, uh, that I have. I have a, a number of them that 
I don't know if many other people have them. Yeah, I because I found them in really weird places, or I had to like really dig. Or the producers that have two hundred followers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah really, yeah. yeah that's like yeah. that's my thing. Yeah, like, I really like a lot of the guys I, I buy from. Mm. Of course, there are some of the bigger names, but it's like, yeah, I I, I really try not even to follow the really big labels. I really try right. to dig. It's like yeah. if I search for music for three hours, I might find three or four tracks. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I actually have a folder. So for those ones, I actually have a folder called Gems. Ah. So I, I call them Tech Gems, Techno Gems, and uh, Deep uh, deep Gems. Nice. So if you ever find one that you know hardly anybody ever has or even heard this producer, right. I just throw it into that folder. I love because that. Because you could play it in, in a year, six months, two yeah. years. Nobody, still nobody's heard it. Yeah. So I, I have a special folder for called Gems. Yeah, I, might, for I, might, I might adopt that because yeah, I like Yeah, like you just, gems, you yeah, because you just throw them in there and you know you know no one has those ones. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, music organization is... Uh, Another topic. Mm. So, mm. That's like something I'm still. I yeah, always yeah, yeah. revise on how I organize my music. Well, let's, let's go into it. Like, how are you guys? What are you guys doing? I mean, do you? I I've kind of always been. I like to uh, mix by the 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 key, the, the color wheel, and I'm sure you guys yeah, do I, too. Yeah, mixed and key. Yeah. yeah. Um, but like, how do you keep that stuff organized? I mean, I think everyone's kind of now being forced to use like record box. Um, you know, on your USBs and that sort of thing. Yeah, that, but everyone has their own kind of helpful. own. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have a process. I mean, first of all, I guess shopping for stuff. I've got you know, I've got folders mm -hmm. uh, by by genre. But then it's like I've got sub genres. But this is all stuff that's internal to me. It's yeah. not. There's no set rule of that. So it's like it's it's something yeah, I yeah. don't. And then you know, I might have stuff based off of like the mood or if it's like, mm -hmm. a, you know, a, a banger, like, you know, something trippy or deep or just, you know, it has to, your, how you organize your music has to mm -hmm. fit you. Right. Um, but, you know, I have stuff set aside in folders on like Beatport that, you know, might be two years old that I didn't get to buy. But that, that same thing goes into my, you know, my catalog on my, on my Mac. Yeah. So right. it's just how I have stuff. But. <laughs> Um, I think nowadays it's more or less uh, I'm organizing and almost buying music now, it's sad to say, but based off of the event I'm playing. Mm, yeah. So, you know, I have so much stuff set aside, but then if I'm, you know, playing an event and I know what type of music mm. um, I'm going to play, or it's like, okay, this is going to be a techno event, or, you know, it's, it's always helpful if I know what time I'm playing, so it's like, okay, then I can really narrow down, like, okay, this is good, good opener stuff. Yeah, this is, right. If it's an after hours, okay, this is some good 3 a.m. music. Or, yeah. You know, it's, it's, yeah. I, I know some people use, different. like, color coding for that. Like, purple purple might be, like, a good, like, really end-of-the-night track that's kind of chill, vibey, right? Like, uh, red, obviously, like, peak night. You know, orange is kind of leading up to that. Yellow might be, like, good opener for all that, you know? Um, I'm still kind of <clears throat> adapting the, the, the color coding thing. It just takes a long time to go through your fucking music yeah, and, and, yeah. and do all this. So, so I heard a good thing. So the same person, Ramiro Lopez, I mean, he's been DJing, yeah, since the 90s as well, and mm -hmm. big producer, has his own label and everything. Uh, last time he was here, he was actually telling me he's going to change the way he organizes his music too. Hmm. So like you said, people are always changing the way they organize yeah, music. Like, yeah, right. you always find another way to reorganize your music. Yeah. But he's going to the same, he's going into that of the energy of the music, you know, peak time, mm -hmm. closing time, open mm -hmm. time. Yeah. So he's separating his tech house and techno into three different levels each. So mm -hmm. three is the high energy, fast paced, high BPM techno. Yep. Two is like, you know, mid, you know, mid time. And one is kind of like that deeper techno. That's, that's and same thing for tech. Set up. It's like Interesting. I always have like a, a, a high, a medium, yeah. low as, as far as energy. And that's just, again, that's like to you what you consider right. is high energy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or based off the gig, like, okay, this is the highest energy I'm going to play that night. Because oh, yeah. I know I'm not going to. Play yeah. this banger at ten thirty or eleven o'clock. Right. So this is mm -hmm. the highest I'm going to keep it, and then I can start dumping stuff in that. What will you guys make? Uh, me, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, so yeah, for me, I mean, I, I mean, I'm, I haven't been DJing as long as these guys, so I actually still put together playlists for the night. You know, uh, that's, that was that was going to be my question. Yeah. Oh, okay. I do that that's, too that's sometimes. What I was just about. Yeah. yeah, and then uh, and the main thing is too, like. Like I'm, I'm a real stickler, and I want to play songs that I've already played out too yeah. much, yeah. or that you know I always want the new stuff. So I download new music. He does too. We all pretty much download new music, but most of my playlist is pretty much for that night. Yeah. Could be anywhere between right. 25 and 40 tracks for me. Yeah. Um, and then what I do is I order, I put that order. And of course, not track by track, but in general, from lowest energy to highest energy. That right. way, when you come onto the decks, 
depending where the energy is, you know where you, you want to start in your playlist, which has the most energy. Because they're new tracks, you're still kind of familiar, you're not completely familiar with them. Right. But if they're already, for me, if they're already in order from low energy to high energy and, you know, BPM and everything, mm -hmm. I kind of know where to start my set depending on the DJ before or if I'm starting, you know, yeah, or right. where I want to end. So uh, for specific big gigs, I'll, you know, I'll make a playlist and then I'll order them low energy to high energy. Yeah. And then the other folders, gems, and I also have, uh, which I've been doing for a while, is I have an uh, old and new. So mm. uh, once I'm done with a playlist from a track, I'll go ahead and move the best tracks of that um, playlist to new, to my new folder. New uh, tech, yeah. new, new techno, new deep. Yep. So everything that I know has been out, you know, less than a year. Nice. Then eventually, once that gets too full, then I start moving stuff to the old uh, right. folder. So right. that's how I have Actually, my USB. Um, yeah. As far as what's stored on my, my computer, I, I like house clean once a year. Once the <laughs> once a new year happens, like tracks that are two years older from when I purchased them, I'll typically slap on my external hard drive. So I'm not keeping that stuff. It's like I still own them and yeah. I can get them if I want them. But it's like, you know, I'll, usually what's on my actual laptop, it's me purchased within the last two years. Right. Um, right. Um, and then uh, I'm always, uh, I always go and check the history of what I played too. So if I played a gig, I'll plug that USB in the record box. I'll actually, you can search, you can go history. Oh, really? And then I'll, I'll make that to a playlist huh. and then I'll actually drag and drop that into my folder for that gig oh interesting so it's like you know i have all the tracks i thought or i wanted to play and pull from but then here is my actual what i played that night yeah so uh, for me i'm 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 honestly i'm horrible with remembering uh either the producer or the the track title right so i can always go back i'm like i know i played this at halcyon mm. and boom 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 i can find it that <coughs> way yeah so right. I, I know I, I know i had a good reaction to this track Boom. Yep. You know, history. Okay, yeah, I remember I played it like, you know, 40 minutes in. Boom, there it is. Right. So. Yeah, listening to uh, to Joe Rogan's podcast, and he always talks about, like, comedy and doing stand-up and open mics and that sort of thing. And there's a lot of, uh, like, similarities there. You know, they'll they'll write new jokes and, like, test them out in these little, like, you know, 30-person venues or 20-person venues and kind of, like, try out these jokes. And I feel like it's kind of similar with, like, with DJing, right? Because you might have this new track and you're like, okay, I mean, I'm, I'm digging it here in my, my house or my apartment, but, like, you don't know exactly how it's going to work with the audience and the context of things and so you're still kind of trying them out mm -hmm. so you might you might play one and it does okay and you're like okay but then you might try another one and it does great and you're like okay that's that's getting you know five yeah, star yeah. or whatever yeah so uh, i think that works great for uh, comedy but um and it works good for djing as well mm -hmm. um but i think as djs we're kind of already we're pretty super confident with the tracks that we're yeah. playing because we put a lot of thought into downloading this yeah. and playing it yeah, so I and then with ex over experience, you kind of know what will work for a certain party or whatnot, you right. know. But there have been times. I mean, I'm still a new DJ, um, yeah. relatively speaking, and I've played some tracks, you know, that I was like, man, that's a great track. You know? <laughs> I'm gonna play this, and then it ends up being too hard for somebody, yeah, you know, or right. not enough energy, and it just kind of goes yeah. flat, you yeah. know. Yeah. So then for future use, you gotta remember, okay, well, this track, yeah, that was yeah. a little. The too the too hard thing is very subjective, because too hard for some. Like, it's all relative. <laughs> it's that's all what Einstein relative. said, yeah. right? Yeah, right. <laughs> it's all relative. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's such an interesting thing because yeah some people you know it's all about just keeping the energy where it should be at that particular moment in the night or in the event yeah, or whatever you know it's to me it's it's playing for the time slot right that's i'm like really mm -hmm. keen on that i think most experienced djs that's you know it's like a no-brainer but it's like you know djing 101 yeah um, you know playing for the time slot um, right not not going in at 9 30 10 o'clock and you're like opening it up with this like dance floor filler track that right. should be played at like you know 1 a.m for yeah. the you know headliner it's like you know it goes back to it's like how are you going to give these people that are here to dance you know room to breathe yeah right you know you, you know yeah. it's, you're there to it's a cadence there, you're there for a purpose yes. if you're there as a support dj as an opener you're there to warm the room up right you know it's but that's actually very tricky in its own too. It is. Because once you start getting past that, uh, you know, closer to that like 11, 11.30 slot and the headliner might come around around 12, 12.30, you know, house is packed at that point. So yeah. then, you know, you've- And so that's when you start going into your other folders you yeah. outside yeah. of your playlist you know, and right. picking up from- You're catering to the crowd within, <clears throat> you know, you got to give room and let mm -hmm. the audience mm -hmm. know that the headliner is also going to come on soon. So right. it's like, you've got to kind of flatten it out. Do you, do but you guys bring it back down just a little bit towards I, the I end? I typically like if do, you're, <clears> but <throat> if, you know, if it's, 
nothing's planned. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> if you know if the audience, if people dancing or are, are, are digging it, then yeah. you know. But typically, I, I try to leave room for you know the, the yeah. headliner. Right. So the so people know that there's you know a change when he goes on or she goes on. Yeah. Yeah, I've talked to headliners about that too. Like, you know, do you, you know, if, if your sound is naturally heavier than the headliner, you know, like, what do you do? I've talked to mm -hmm. headliners about that, mm -hmm. and yeah, they say they say it's okay to play a little harder and then bring it down, like you mm -hmm. said, mm -hmm. right before the uh, the main headliner gets on, um, just as long as you're not wearing out the the dance floor, yes. the playing banks, because they're dancing, they're dancing, they're dancing. The headliner comes on and they're kind of like, whoa, okay, they're, they're already, back and dancing, yeah, like, already <laughs> exhausted. You know? right, so yeah. you, another thing too in DJing is you want to give breaks between these high high energy levels in your set, you know, yeah. give people kind of a break. To people only have so dance. much, you yeah. know, and that, that's kind of what I was telling you guys about the, um, uh, before we started recording, uh, the, you know, those, those nights where it's just a constant beat for seven hours, you know, from 9 p.m. till 2 or 3 a.m. It's like, I, I, I get it, you know, and this is just me speaking for my personal taste, but I do, I, you got to have a little bit of a cadence and you know have some breaks and that sort of thing give people a, a, a bit yeah. of time to rest their legs and you know uh -huh. yeah, yeah I've, I've seen a lot of uh hard djs playing and even in their sets you you might, you might think that they're playing that hard non-stop but even in their sets there are some breaks you know absolutely you know yeah. even though it's not quite of a break that we that we know you right. know it still is right. a break for everybody's on the dance floor yeah really when, do, when yeah. you when you look at the stuff too uh that you know is being played at like um a main stage at EDC or something like kind of the big room, the big house mm -hmm. stuff. Um, a lot of it too is, you know, uh, when you look at it as, as a waveform in, you know, uh, on the CDJ in tractor in a mm -hmm. DAW, whatever. Um, a lot of that stuff too is, you know, it'll have kind of this long intro that it, it has energy, but there's no drums yet, right? And then it, the drums kick in for maybe. 16 bars and that's that's the peak of the the first half of the track and then it goes into another little breakdown and then there's and so i mean tracks like that are just being mixed you know from one to the next into each other and so you really have these kind of like these big dramatic peaks of time where people are dancing and the rest of the time the people are kind of like doing yeah, you know doing one of these and then you know with like techno or <laughs> trance or something or, or or house music it's kind of a little bit more of like this steady thing right and you and you, you expect to have drums in the intro and the outro and the 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 breaks yeah. are a little bit a little bit more flipped you know mm -hmm. what i mean and, and maybe a little bit shorter, it's kind of about keeping the groove going, you know? Yeah, musically, I think that's a big thing between underground and mainstream music is, mm. the, is the breaks themselves. We want, musically, yeah. uh, the breaks themselves will have a little bit more percussion, a little bit more things that keep you moving, right. rather than the long, swaying, melodic, you know, breakdowns between yeah. between the drops. I think that's another big difference between them. I think them, with right? the mainstream and, like, EDM music, I mean, that's, like, everybody waits for the drop. Yes. That's like the thing. Like you're. It's you're, become you're, like a meme. Like where's the drop? Yeah, you know? yeah. You're, you're 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 making that track, and it's like I've got to get the drop like perfect. Yeah. Like, that's the thing, and that's what people expect. You know. It's like Even we, people on dance floor have to get the drop perfect when they dance. Yeah. 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 Or start right, shuffling. Yeah. They gotta they gotta they gotta point to the buddy <laughs> right on time. Right. Or start the shuffle right yeah. on the spot. Yeah. Oh, uh, it's funny. Yeah. yeah it's differences, a, but you know, that's also like. Uh, like you're saying, like with a house and techno set, you mm. know that steady, that four by four. Yeah. Um, there's also, you know, you know, people mix in different techniques. You know, some sure. DJs, some big DJs, absolutely hate breaks in their tracks. Mm. Yeah. If you actually watch how they're, you know, actually put tracks together when they're transitioning, it's like, you know, some of them just there's no break. Yeah. yeah. They'll, they'll mix into the break, and you know, they just they don't want that. They don't want the dip. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah, there's times where, where even some tracks I really love will have two. For me, I don't like dr uh, breaks that are completely melodic. Mm, you know, I, I, yeah. I like to have a snare or something hi hat, hi -hat in yeah, between. Right, you know, right. so sometimes when I love a track and I'm playing and I'm gonna play it or I'm playing it, and I know the, I know the break is too much of a break for me or for mm -hmm. what I think the people might hear, I'll I'll, I'll kind of layer over it with the next track coming uh, in, kind of tease yeah. that track, right? And it kind of already gives maybe, it a little percussion. Maybe in loop between. the intro drums from or the that, next track, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? Kind of like, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. so that for me, that kind of overlaps that big break on which I'm yeah. you know, not too fond of. So. Right. And like, right. that's what he's getting at. A lot of DJs, yeah, they'll sometimes they'll just mix over it. They'll just start the new track and just right. cut cut that first track halfway through yeah right you know? and some, some people even do like dj like they'll do like edits they'll do their own edit oh, yeah. where yeah. they'll take the the stereo yeah. file and you know shorten this shorten and, and take something it's just cut copy paste right. and take out four and, yeah well, yeah take out yeah. a full multiple of four bars yeah and yeah. Then, yeah it'll be right back <laughs> right. where we left off that's, but that's, that's that's the beauty of looping though too it's like yeah you can, 
um, you know, if you've got multiple decks at your disposal, I mean, right. you've got that ability. Do you guys use the the, uh, the, the looping function on the CD, CDJs uh, much? I yeah, have. He uses it quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, to me, like a must. For me, too, yeah. I know not everyone uh, does it, or, or even like the Q buttons. I know a lot of people that don't use the Q buttons much at all. Um, for me, the I've, I'm, I'm frequently using the Q buttons and the loop. Um, just because I, I like to like like I'll, I'll figure out a part where I want I want like I'll, I'll get let, let's say like the the intro is too long for what I need it to be so I'll set like a uh, like a hot cue maybe 16 bars in already and that way I know that whenever I you know I can kind of tap it in and then whenever mm-hmm. I release it then I know that I have eight bars or another 16 bars before the next thing happens yeah, you yeah. know what I mean um, so I you know um, yeah I've seen I'll a lot of headliners those. watching from behind the decks yeah they'll mm-hmm. loop right through the middle of the track because they like. <laughs> You they know, just, the, you know, the, the, the a, like the atmosphere on it, you know, right, or something, yeah. you know? A certain piece of a track. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe even like a breakdown and loop that and then mix that into whatever. And yeah, if that's you on your third. something that's in a breakdown and actually play it <clears throat> on the, yeah, he uses the it quite part a of bit, the track yeah. that's, you know, going balls deep. Right. You know, you, you're just, it's just layering to me when I, yeah. when I think of looping, it's like you have that ability to layer and, um, you know, I think for mm-hmm. any, any like big DJ, that's just, I, I think it's like the norm. It's like, yeah, you better be able to play on three decks right it's like right yeah for me the it's loop boring if you play on two it's boring if you know i'm starting to try to get into that now but it's like yeah. i'm i just feel kind of bottlenecked of playing on two decks now yeah right right Is yeah it, i've used loops a lot quite a bit on acapellas when you're doing an acapella over a track that's you know just instrumental right uh using loops on that uh, a lot of djs also use loops at the end when they're about to mix another track Loop, uh-huh. loop, loop the end of track one while you're bringing in track two. Yes. You know, that's pretty, that's pretty yeah, common yeah. as well. Yeah, you run out of room or run out of time. I mean, that's yeah. just... That's how I started using loops is I was like, you know, you kind of like Time this oh shit moment. Like, you know? oh, no, <laughs> yeah. I've, got, I've got a minute. I've got 45 seconds left. I've, mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's like... Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a good tool too. Like w- when maybe like a, a a track doesn't have enough of an intro or something, you can kind of create. You know, you can get this loop going, and it kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. You Some know, tracks just take a real long time to get started. Yeah, yeah. right. It's a good time or to or if you're if you have to kind of uh, you're forced to for whatever reason uh, mix a track in that you don't really you know is not the right key or whatever. You don't want this like you know kind of oh you know. Um, not like it's a train wreck, but it, they're not, you know, it, you, you try to kind of make sure at least if they're not in the same key or close, you're not blending the kind of melodic ele- elements. So you loop the drums or the percussion and kind of, kind of, you know, do something like Separate that. Them, yeah. Give them a little bit of time between the melodic mm-hmm. elements, you know? Yeah. yeah. Nice. Uh, let me, uh, I think we already, we already uh, uh, blew through some of these just kind of organically. Um, but uh, let me ask you, what... Uh, do you guys have a like a holy grail record that you play for pretty much like like it's your favorite track to play or, or you play it in almost every set? Mm. I mean, I've got too many favorites. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, I say we got a lot of favorites, yeah, but it's, for- yeah, it's I, I'm I'm pretty self conscious about playing some too much. I yeah, like honestly, so to okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. As much as I have favorites, but uh, I kind of hit on that before though. Like I. I I sometimes try to really incorporate like a classic, maybe not like it might not be a big hit, but a classic old track, especially sure. if I've got some old school like house for techno heads. So like I guess maybe the better question would be, do you have a, do you have a, uh, a Holy Grail like, like artist or label that you, mm-hmm. that you enjoy? Actually, now that I think about it, I actually do have the song that I play, I've been playing probably about eight years and it's actually, I play right around Halloween time. Yeah. It's uh, which you know, I've talked to you about it many times. He's been to a few ha- Halloween parties with me. But uh, yeah, it's a it's a remix of Michael Jackson's Thriller, and oh. it's, it's the most amazing tech house really? track. Yeah, so anytime around Halloween, I'm always playing that. And See, I, sometimes I've played it. Actually, honestly, that's how I'll play. I'll just play it on the flute sometimes. Yeah, you know, on midsummer sometimes. Yeah, you know? right. Well, but, I feel like uh, remixes get a little bit of a pass for that too. Yeah, you know, yeah. because so, when so those are what I call classics. I call classics something yeah. that has uh, popular, you know, vocal or something, you know, mm. from you know '80s, '90s, whatever. Right. You know, so yeah. anything with that it has has a new great beat. That no one's ever heard. Yeah, you know something. Yeah. Uh, something that should always be played. Yeah. Right, right. A well done remix is, uh, is kind of yeah. kind of hard to find remix sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. Um, what are uh, what are some of the your favorite shows? Yeah. <laughs> what are the fa- some of the favorite shows you guys have done? Uh, done. Yeah. Um, Put on or played either one. Um, that's a good one, man. <laughs> I'd say Oliver Hunman here. Yeah, Ooh, yeah, hey. that's yes. uh, that's for me. Yeah, Oliver Hunman. That yeah, we played like, here. Uh, yeah. I'm like, uh, you know, I, I love minimal techno. 
yeah and, uh, that's kind of what oliver is and his label senso sounds i mean mm. it's like that for me was like kind of like the icing on the cake like the, yeah. the peak of my <laughs> dj career yeah, yeah. Um, and uh the room that night like it was full um, it was a, it was a it yeah. Albert Hooman's huge. I don't know if you heard of him, but it, is, yeah. it so was a know. packed house. And I mean, I remember like uh, after I played, just I, I had to go down to the dance floor. It was like shoulder to shoulder. I'm like squeezing and sucking <laughs> and climbing over people. Yeah. Um, had to get a ladder. <laughs> but you're no, like that, a canoe. Yeah. Just, the the you know, Oliver Hooman show. That was probably, yeah. Um, Wow. In so many ways, too, I think it was good. We, uh, we got to play on the Model 1 for the first time. Oh, the Model 1 mixer. Yeah, that was, yeah. it was, you know, ha, ha, we had to learn it on the, like in 10 minutes. You're right. Uh, but it was fun playing on it. Um, we got a lot of kudos afterwards. Like, our, yeah. we, we did a back to back for that one. Um, um, and I think we did great on that one. Uh, yeah. We, got, we, got, oh, we yeah. got a lot of props at the yeah. end. You nice. know? Yeah, and, uh, and that mix is on SoundCloud. Nice. Hey, yeah. That one is, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plug That's it. Right. Plug yeah, it. yeah, yeah. We, we have a sound cloud. Yeah. music. There you go. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I've, I've found that the, the Model 1 isn't too different. It's uh, It has just has two extra tracks, you know, so it's, what, six channels, I think. Um, then it's got the whole, like... Uh, yeah, it's just the... Well, the equalizer is different. Is I mean, it? Yeah. The, 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 the equalizer, band? you select the frequency you want to filter. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes, right. Or the, yeah, yeah, that yeah, you want to filter. Like yeah, you, you, right. Three band EQ. Yeah. So you, um, you sh- it's they actually call it a sculpting. It's an uh, sculpting, a sculpting EQ. EQ. Right. You're and, a surgeon, not a DJ <laughs> anymore. <laughs> yes, but yeah, it was it it was a little bit of a learning curve. I mean, yeah. you know, the the basics of any mixer, they're all the same, but like yeah, it was a uh, it was a really clean yeah, it's mm. really super clean, refined. Well, it comes very with this whole warm mixer. Yeah, it comes with a whole uh, like a rack mount sized audio interface that plugs in with a giant fucking really? D plug cable, and then That's that goes out as well too. Yeah, yeah, yeah but right? I, yeah, I, I remember like you know traditional normal like DJ stuff. You know, you're trying to just take the bass out of one track and bring in the bass on the other real quick to get that like nice effect. Yeah. Um, that didn't happen with the model one <laughs> Be- because you know you're it's just like kind of refining and sculpting yeah. it and just it. right so i was like okay this is yeah it was a nice little learning curve but it was oh man that mixer i loved it yeah um, it's like a rolls royce of yeah. mixers yeah oh yeah no we're stuck we're like what yeah. <laughs> but yeah no the pioneer mixers you know you have the the high high pass frequency to the right low pass frequency to the left uh, but for the Model 1, you select what frequency you want to adjust, mm. and then you can either fa- take it out or add more of it, of that frequency. Yeah. So that's how that works. So we had to get kind of used to that. You know, it wasn't just, right. oh, let's hit that high filter. You know, it was right. kind of like, okay, let's select the high filter and let's add, you know, add more of that. Or, yeah. You know, so that's it was a little, little different to use, but yeah. Uh, the Pioneer, sometimes when you hit that filter, it adds a lot of gain, a lot of power on the way out, you know, so it can oh, be too much. Right. Yeah, right. And with that, you hit the you, those filters and smooth. Yeah, yeah. Every, it's crisp. every yeah. band of the EQ was basically a filter, and then they had mm. a, a main filter. Yeah. Like if you wanted to filter all three bands. Right. I think that I think I think you know that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but guy. yeah. I think, I think we're getting at so many reasons why that was an amazing show for yes, us. Yes, yeah. you're right. Yeah, we're on that. We, I mean, it was just the crowd. The place was full because Oliver Hootman. Yeah, uh, he has amazing music. Um, and then yeah, we and then together we had a great back to back set where yeah. I don't think we really messed up at all, and nice. you know we just flowed really well. You know. Yeah. So I think in a lot of ways that was probably our best show. My my mine. You know? That's awesome. Yeah, I, I second that. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Have you guys uh, have you guys played any of like the I mean, maybe maybe you have because uh, you've been DJing longer but have you guys played any any or many of like the kind of underground like warehouse parties the quintessential kind of you know they still happen today but it was much more happening before electronic music really moved into the nightclub scene you know so the uh, underground underground raves yeah. underground warehouse raves yeah. Yeah. I mean those are still happening uh, oh yeah today yes um, but back then I was definitely more of a spectator I mean. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it was really hard to break in uh, to <laughs> to the scene yeah. as far as getting booked for stuff like that. Because, I mean, you're talking about massive parties. I mean, right. you know, 20,000, 30,000 people. Oh, those are massive. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then on the on the flip side, you know, there were also the, the smaller parties, you know, a couple mm-hmm. hundred people. Mm-hmm. But um, it was... Time back then. Yeah, yeah I think I think Tone yeah. Tone Tone played had some warehouse parties on his own. Back oh, really? Then. Yeah. 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 Um, Juan Beats played some underground white raves. For he, sure. Yeah, he's been around since yeah since home base days in Oakland. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. My that was first my first party home base. Uh, yeah. Planet Rock. 
Planet Rock. Planet Rock. My first one was at, my first one was Atlantis actually, and that's that's what got me underground music. Oh really? Was in the west of Oakland. Uh, oh, yeah. I was already in the nightclub scene. I was already in the house, but I hadn't been to a rave yet. Um, so well, on beats, I was actually knew him from the nightclubs, and then um, he and another friend were like, hey, let's go to this rave. Like, yeah, I've been wanting to. Yes. So I went out there, Atlantis. Man, probably about fifteen thousand people. Green Velvet was the headliner. Um, Donald wow. Glaude was DJing. Holy Hippie shit. Hippie and Halo. Um, yeah, I've seen them plenty of times back then. Yeah. So I walked into this rave, I'm like, what the fuck is this music? This shit is <laughs> fucking sick as fuck. Yeah, you know I what I mean? Uh, All I knew was how, you know, club, you know, club house music, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I just walked in, I'm like, wow, this is fucking dope. Who's playing? Yeah. Hippie and Halo were playing. Next was Donald Glaude. I'm like, man, who's this guy? You know, right. Donald Glaude. Like, after that, went out, bought, I went to uh, Rasputin's, bought all these uh, Moonshine record albums, Donald Glaude, Carl Cox. America. Yeah, yeah. yeah I did see that. Um, um, uh, but no, the one that uh, that they were putting out was mix sessions, live mix sessions. So that they had oh, live yeah. recordings of Donald Glaw, live recording of Carl Cox, Tall Paul. So, that, so after that rave, bought all those um, CDs, and that's when I got into underground music. Nice. Uh, but Juan, yeah, he had played some uh, underground raves yeah. uh, before that time. But, yeah. yeah. But that was sick. way before my DJ time. Way right. before. Yeah, but, I, I played a I played a, a number of them. Uh, I think too also because it, it, from my experience uh the the different genres kind of had especially you know here uh in the city in the nightclub scene it was a little bit i mean of course dubstep had its had its time in the the nightclub scene that sort of thing yeah you're not going to find a whole lot of drum and bass you know in the in the nightclub scene uh for sure house music you know trance um but you know i think when i kind of first started i was playing uh, a little more like electro -y stuff a little more like dubstep occasionally and um you know, just that it, it, it kind of lent itself for me to get, to get booked at these like renegades and uh, what, like what house years parties. And, when you yeah, started? Like, uh, well, I think I started around like 2008, 2009. Okay, so that's right like, before, yeah, yeah, yeah. Before, yeah, yeah. We met. Right. Um, and so I, I did play a lot of those. Those were those were fun, but um, yeah, I, you know, I think also too just the fact that uh, uh, the uh, house music is, is is accepted in you know it's like you don't really have to throw a, a warehouse party uh, these yeah. days you know unless you want to. Well, I think uh, so. I think we kind of misunderstood your question. So we were thinking like '90s raves. I think like massive. Yeah, well, that yeah. too. That too. Yeah. I yeah, mean, kind of so, open-ended question. You know? Yeah. So yeah. no, we've definitely played a lot of warehouse underground. I mean, we we, yeah. we do underground. Like I have one. Yeah. I think, uh, uh, coming I think up next we'd weekend, probably but... do more undergrounds than... Oh, really? Oh, interesting. Okay. Cool. I mean, we do quite a bit, yeah. I mean, yeah. We, we did uh, two uh, tour... Well, actually, no. We did our own... It was our actual own after hours underground nice. uh, a couple times last year. But we also played a lot of after hours. So know? this is a perfect segue because I was also wanted to ask you guys about after hour culture because it's a very... And I mean, of course, there's things that you, you probably don't want to get into specifics about uh, too deep there. But um, I've always found it such a fascinating thing. The after hours, uh, you know, the culture is, you know, people aren't done partying when, when they stop serving mm -hmm. alcohol or they shut down the music at 2 a.m. or 3 or 4 or whatever. Um, and you know, having been to a lot of the after hours, uh, I just think it's such a, a, a cool thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've been producing uh, or putting together after hours events since 2012. If you remember, uh, it's okay to talk about it because it's not around anymore. Remember yeah. Halleck? Halleck, yeah. Do you remember with the yeah. with the with the uh, glow in the dark paint all over the walls? That was the office that? building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Halleck over there by the finance by financial Embarcadero. Yeah, Embarcadero. So I've been doing uh, after hours since then, and yeah, no, that's not a thing anymore. That place, no, no, no. Oh, that, fuck, place that place was ago. great. Yeah, that place was cool. Yeah, and with the couches, and, couches. Yeah, well, yeah, we should explain it to people that really. So you would like essentially, um, you'd get a text or whatever, you'd find out where the place was if you didn't know. Word of mouth. Yeah. Uh, word of mouth, and then you'd you'd literally go to this like alleyway. This dark alleyway and there'd be like a dude standing there and all on the black corner. on the corner <laughs> keep it down keep walking you're right yeah <laughs> and uh you know of course if you look still like if, that. yeah i know <laughs> nothing changed yeah still like that that hasn't changed at all changed. it's still yeah still on the ground yeah. yeah so then you would uh you would you know kind of give him the nod and he would let you in and, and you'd walk up these flights of stairs and it was literally like a like an uh, abandoned office building like you would see in fucking office space the movie or something mm -hmm. you know but it had all the cubicles pulled out and and, and uh, still had the push-up ceilings and the fucking you know, all that shit. Um, but they had, you know, neon spray paint on the walls with black lights, and they had uh, couches all the way around, all the way good around, sound and a sound, system. good sound system. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was that was. I had some fucking wild times there. Um, yeah. What? So I mean, and I'm always so curious. Like, like what? What piqued my interest was like, how did that happen? Did somebody own this like abandoned office building? They're like, yeah, let's just do parties. Well, <laughs> we're not, you know, doing officey things in here. Like, yeah. So actually, you know? I remember my first after. That was probably about two thousand. Let me see. So I started doing it probably about two thousand eight. Mm. So one of the promoters who's still around in San Francisco actually, actually two of them actually started that one together, and I kind of think that was the first, first 
first or second after I was in San Francisco, and that was oh. that was called Insomnia. Oh right. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not gonna say who it is, but yeah, that one place was. I mean, that place was amazing. That was probably about f probably about four or five times the size of Halcyon. Wow. High ceilings. Yeah. Cool. Same thing. Couches all the way around. Great sound system. Some of your best local DJs. Yep. Uh, opening at two o'clock. Same thing too. Mm -hmm. You got to go there with a text. You know, got to know mm -hmm. somebody. Nobody's giving free. Or is absolutely no guest list. <laughs> right. You know. Right. Uh, of course. You know, there's a bar. Um, uh, there's a, there was usually a, twenty I mean, or thirty I, bucks per person. Or yeah, something. yeah, 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 yeah. And Chicks uh, in actually, free. I think, yeah. <laughs> there's a price to pay if you want to keep going. Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and then, I, I would always see the um, like the the headliners here will oftentimes go to those after hours and play another set. Yeah, there has been. I, I saw happen. I saw Donald Glaud play at uh, Halleck. Yeah, and yeah, that was actually my party. You were there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> actually, yeah. 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 I, I seen Stacy Stacey Poland play at an after hours. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was like uh, maybe about two years ago. Sick. Yeah. I yeah. Like I just seen him playing at the main club, and then like literally, you know, that party dispersed, and then it kept going, and he was right. going back to back with yeah. another one of the. Yeah. The well-known local guys here. Yeah, I saw uh, Sharam play one. Um, there was a Green might, Velvet did one. Did he? Yeah. Green Velvet played with uh, Bo Kelly once. Wow. Yeah, Bo, or Bo Kelly got to play with Green Velvet one yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. So there was this place. It was a purple building outside. It was in the Soma district, and uh, it was like it was again kind of this like office -y. About five six it, years ago. Yeah. It's called the Purple Building. Was it? Yeah, it's called the Purple Building. That's what we used to refer to it. <laughs> but they had a really interesting sound system. So that's where I saw, saw Sharam play. But the sound system was these like strips of those like tiny two inch or one inch uh, like speakers for the highs, and then they had like subs down below. But it was mm. probably like like it looked like it was like sixty or like like a hundred and eighty of these speakers going kind of floor to ceiling, and these just really thin strips. Wow. But it oh. somehow provided like yeah. enough you know enough sound to get loud and to be you know enjoyable and like you know you could dance to it. Um, but I thought that was really interesting, and it's funny you call it the purple building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah there's there's been it. probably about. Four, four different locations, four or five different locations since before all the ones that are open now. Yeah. At least. Right. I'd probably say, yeah, at least five or six, yeah. So that was one of them. But no, yeah, right. a lot of headliners, if they have a gig out here, if they know somebody local, you know, yeah. the lo a local friend will be like, hey, there's after hours, you want to get on? Right. So usually what they have to do, of course, what they have to do, they have to talk with the main gig, the main club owner, and yeah. just say, hey, you know what? You know, I was offered a gig to play after hours, do you mind? So it's kind of that yeah. agreement before, as long as right. there's no announcement you know, yeah. prior to the end of the set here. Right. You know, and once, it, once they've already done their yeah, show yeah, here, yeah. it's like, yeah, whatever, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. That's the way it works. Yeah, Interesting. Yeah. Well, but yeah, no, Green Velvet played once. Yeah. With Bo Kelly. Shit. I'm going to start hitting you up about the after hours. Cause when I get off here, hey, we like, got I'm, one Saturday I'm, out. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm like, I'm sober. I'm like, I need to fucking have a I'm drink ready, and party, I'm ready to party now. at 4am. I'm, I'm, I'm done working. You're right. Yeah. At the best club. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm, I'm tempted to like, you know, Go to the bar. It opens at six a.m. But I want to. I don't want to look like that fucking alcoholic. <laughs> I'm like, no, no. I literally just got off work. Like, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, it's funny. Um, so let's see what else I got here. Uh, how are we doing on time? It is. Oh, I got one, five till one. One twelve uh, hours. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, what do you guys' uh, What do you guys' home DJ setups like? What do you What do you guys? Do you have CDJs and turntables? Or? Yep. So I actually had a CDJ setup um, that was really, really kind of older model. So yeah. I had I had the eight hundreds. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I had eight, I had eight hundreds and then a six hundred mixer nice. before. Uh, when I first uh, was when I was first taught how to DJ by Juan Beats. Yeah. We actually started on vinyls. So nice. he started teaching me on vinyls. Me and Chris. So Chris and I learned together. Yeah. Uh, he started teaching us on vinyls. And then uh, Juan wanted to go over to digital. Mm. So that's when we switched. So I didn't get a chance to actually learn how to play on vinyl right. other than the month that, uh, month that we did. But after that, my first setup, yeah, it was yeah. something simple. Yeah, kind of appropriate because you, you play mostly on CD. Yeah, and then this yeah. was uh, when I got that setup. That must have been about 2000, uh, yeah, 11, 12. So those were mm. still previous model before. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. nice. What about you? Um, so I've kind of reverted at home. Mm. Um, I'm actually really getting into Tractor. Mm -hmm. So uh, I do use an Allen & Heath uh, Zone PX5 mixer, yeah. uh, one of the newer ones. Um, and I do use two uh, Native Instruments uh, uh, X1 controllers. So nice. I, I actually can play on four decks. Sick. And uh, I still have my turntables, so you know, yeah. I've mainly played records. I don't, I hardly mix vinyl now, but yeah, yeah really just, um, the possibilities are endless with right. Tractor. Oh I mean, man, I love people, Tractor. A lot of people, uh, 
kind of look at it sideways yeah. when you mention that. But uh, well, I mean, shit, Richie Houghton uses it exclusively, uh, if, uh, so you know, he, he's, he's, <laughs> yeah, doing, no, he's using four to six. But uh, fucking, I'm also, you know, uh, I'm also, uh, I have Ableton uh, mm -hmm. mapped into my mixer. Yeah. So you know, I'm layering some Ableton stuff. I'm starting to just kind of go that route. So right. Ableton and uh, I'm just, I've really been reading into it. So it's like. Uh, Incorporating the effects from Ableton, sending them into uh, oh, wow. Tractor. I'm yeah, I'm starting to kind of getting deep. Get, get <laughs> kind of deep into it, but literally, yeah, yeah, you're right, it's, yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, no, I uh, I, don't, I don't think uh, Tractor at all is frowned upon as long as the DJ himself has been playing since the vinyl days. Like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, anytime I see somebody playing on Tractor, I know some people kind of knock, especially people who are not DJs. But if you if somebody's playing tractor and they've been playing since the vinyl days, they got all right. You know all the all the. There's uh, a, well, a lot of people, uh, you know, real quick argument statement mm -hmm. uh, about like uh, sync. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't realize. Okay, if you're a, you know if you do use sync, which you know if I'm on tractor, it's like yeah, I'm using three to four decks. Yeah, it's it's all in sync. It's in time. Yeah. But the amount of preparation that goes involved with that, right? It, it doesn't make you any less of a DJ because yeah. you know your beat grids have to be on point. And uh, just because you've synced a track and you've gotten their tempos at, at the same tempo, you still have to know how to use a mixer. Right. You still have to know when to throw the track in, your transitions, your EQ. And I mean, there's the sync is just like one little piece of DJing or, or beat matching. Yeah, that's, that's, that's not, how I feel too. And, there, and that's not to say people that, you know, use CDJs to a DJ. Uh, I, I can guarantee they're not just doing it by ear most of the time. Right. They're going to glance at the BPM that's on on the pitch adjustment right and then dial it in from there right? yeah that's, that's the truth of the matter <laughs> yeah. if, right if, <laughs> I, I feel like it's kind of an outdated argument at this yeah. point because i remember so uh, i had a pair of uh cdj 1000s and something that they did between the 1000s and like the 2000 nexus models um they the 2000 nexus models stay on beat much easier than the 1000s and i have no idea why I, it, does, it almost doesn't make sense to yeah, me it's digital why it's, it's it, digital why, it, there's no direct there's no right. motor the only thing i the only thing I, the yeah the only thing i could think of is maybe the resolution as to where the the initial first yeah, yeah, yeah. beat digital, drop yeah. you know because that that the might change the one is, yeah, yeah right one. because now yeah if you have like you know the, a million resolution or whatever it's gonna you know and you're a smarter algorithm that detects the beats and all that um it just stays kind of on beat easier um but yeah i've kind of always shared that same sentiment you know i mean if, if, of course if you're just being lazy and you just everything is synced you know and you're using two two decks it's like you know come on but um but yeah i mean the people that are like like i i, I always you know uh, talk about the story like i had one set that i did it was at uh, epr and it was i i started with you know house music and the, you know, electro and then i went to like kind of dubstep and then went into fucking uh, drum and bass and I was able to do all that, like going from 140 to 170 or 180 and, you know, using the sync button and locking those two tracks together. And then you can ramp up the pitch and, or the, you know, the tempo slider oh, okay. and, and literally like you can get this nice, you don't have to do it between yeah, yeah, the, breakdowns or whatever. Yeah, mid -dig, <laughs> right, exactly. Um, so yeah, I think there's, a, there's an argument for, uh, for, you know, and now they're on CDJs. You have a sync button on the CDJs, yeah. uh, you know? Yeah, so. but yeah, but Tractor, yeah, as long as somebody has, you know, put in the work, the years yeah. of, you know, 10, right. 20 years of DJing yeah. or already knows how to play vinyl and learned it in a few years, yeah, all the power to them to, you know, go, go to Tractor and learn how to play on, you know, three, four channels. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So, but yeah, like you said, if, if it's a short way just to get, get out of DJ right. after a year or two using a sync button. Yeah, I mean, those are... Those, like, at least try to put a little bit more effort. Those are the it, same you know? DJs that might show up to a gig with like an iPad that they're going to play. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, might as well. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> oh, that's funny. A uh, pretty um, mix. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, uh, how do you guys... Uh, are you guys familiar with uh, the, the Denon? DJ stuff, and and uh, so I know not everybody is, but um, so Denon has obviously been making like they've been trying to kind of, you know, pioneers yeah, capitalized the, yeah, on pioneers the industry the standard. Industry. I've seen the Denon stuff, and um, uh, I think uh, Roland also has some pretty crazy stuff now. If yeah, you've seen it right. Um, a little bit more like producery DJ stuff, right? With like the TR8S um, and the, all the stuff they linked have together. That, but they uh, like even like basically their CDJ. Oh, if you just want to say their media player. Right? Yeah. It's um, it's pretty advanced. Right. Um, actually, um, not that I'm like a huge fan of his music or style, but uh, Laidback Luke, hmm. he actually does uh, like these YouTube uh, podcasts. He's and, sponsored by Denon. He only um, does Denon. And um, 
yeah, it's like pff, crazy. Right. Just the the stuff that it's like it makes the it makes the you know the CDJs look like turntables. Yeah. Like as far as technology goes, it's like functionality. Yeah, it's like wow, yeah. these CDJs are like outdated compared to these other players. It's crazy. Yeah, I had a chance to uh, to fuck around with them at uh, Guitar Center. I was waiting for something. Yeah, maybe there and... maybe I was wrong. I was assuming Roland because I thought they were green. Do the denim? Is... The denims are green. Okay, so my yes. mistake. My yeah. mistake. So Roland stuff is there okay. is green as okay. well. So yeah, yeah it yeah. was the denim. Yeah. But yeah. yes. I mean, they, they are packed with features. I mean, they you know, their yeah. their standard media player comes with, like, the pads in the front that be, yeah, can be hot cues and, yeah. the you know, and um, just a whole bunch of shit that I, I, I really didn't even have a chance to, like, really dive into. But just looking at them, and then I watched some uh, tutorials or, you know, some demos online. And I was like, fuck, these things are, like, they're really, they're, they're it's really going, like, they're it's going like, at Pioneer's heels to, like you know. It's like apples and oranges. It really makes the yeah. CDJs look like, like a Technique turntable. Yeah. Right, um, but yeah. which is funny that you know, I mean, Pioneer has this kind of stranglehold on the industry yeah. standard. But um, see, you know, Pioneer's awesome, uh, but mm -hmm. everybody knows Pioneer isn't always. Yeah, but it, yeah. it's it's a standard, and it's it's right. stuff that people. I mean, there's a lot of these, there's mm -hmm. a lot of headliners that don't even use CDJs. You no, know? I mean, a couple of Aubrey, she just uses the Model One or controller, laptop. Right. right, you don't see any CDJs up there. Yeah, you know? so right. Some some yeah. go right past it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so, there's. But that's the beauty, you know, it's <clears throat> technology. You have options. It's not just mm. one standard way to DJ. There's not one standard way to produce. Yeah. There's, you know, I mean, there's right and wrong, but it's yeah. like how creative, you know, can you get? Right. You've got all these possibilities. It's, it's good. Yeah. 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 Embrace go, technology. Yes. Yeah. And then you go back to Adam Bear. All he uses is USB. So that's all Adam Bear uses. Three really? Decks. Three decks, three decks USB. zone, and USBs. That's it. Uh, he uses a, the, oh, and then the, the paddle pitch, yeah. no, He uses the Pioneer, the RMX 1000 for his effects. Oh, and, uh, right. But he's really into his guitar pedals too. That's right. Yeah. Oh, well, who is this? Adam Bear. Adam Bear. We had someone else uh, come recently that. Yeah, no laptop. Uh, he, yeah, we had. He he plugged in guitar pedals. Yeah, to the that's mixer. Very common. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. I had you never just, heard of that. Yeah, because uh, you get some crazy delays. Or yeah. You get some crazy reverbs. Uh, right. Those things. Right. Um, like that's like Marco Carolla uses guitar pedals. Uh, Richie Houghton. I mean, that's one of his things he uses. That's not on the open, but yeah. he actually uses the guitar pedal with his foot. Wow. Um, yeah. That's like one of his. Yeah. I mean, it's. See, that would be cool. Is, is, is if you had a, like a like a board, like a guitarist, you, right? You, but you could just plug it into your DJ mixer, you, and then you can. Yeah. yeah. It's just going into. Um, I, I I forget what outputs or inputs. The aux back. or yeah. Yeah. But send and return. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You get some crazy stuff with that. Wow. I feel like that might be like the next level of, uh, of of DJ mixers is having one with like multiple effects outputs so that you could run it into can, a different, uh, you, you know. You can layer them. I mean, even like with the Pioneer, it's like you yeah. can still have an external and it doesn't have to be like a, a Pioneer, but oh, right. I mean, you can layer stuff. You can yeah. use an effect that's you know native to the mixer and then right. still have your external and you're just layering stuff. I've, I've seen DJs also too. I mean, the really, the the... the <laughs> It's really asking a lot of uh, of a venue, and I, I think this is more for like festivals. But I've seen DJs with four RMX 1000s, one for each CDJ, <laughs> and it goes into the RMX 1000 and then into the mixer. So each CDJ yeah, has its own yeah, its own effects before you know. So if you're again, if you have a loop and you want to add some delay or something just on that loop. Um, yeah. But I mean, now we're now we're talking about a DJ setup that's like twenty thousand dollars or more. <laughs> like, yeah, this shit gets that's crazy. That's one of the uh, technical writer. <laughs> yes, right. Yeah. Wait, you want what? what? Like, <laughs> just a real estate for it, it too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, right. Hey, so are you going to come here and actually sound check it? Yeah. No. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Probably not. Yeah. No, probably not. Yeah. <laughs> so how mad would you be if I crossed these wires? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's funny. Um, all right, let's do uh, let's do one more, and then we'll uh, we'll wrap it up here. Um, let's see, what's a good one here? Um, what are what are what are some of the bigger changes you guys have seen in uh, in the music scene in the last uh, like you know ten years? Anything anything stand out uh, in particular to you? Well, in the in the club scene, um, when I got into it, yeah, two thousand, it was. It was house and techno. That was back then. That was that was the thing at Ruby Sky. Right. Saw Carl Cox. Right. Saw all those guys. Um, and then it went to trance. Yeah. There was a, there was a trance phase. So kind of. And you can even see this in the DJ Mag. Uh, yeah, DJ Mag's um, uh, top 100. You mm, know, you can right. see it was used to be all, you know, techno house, and then went to trance for a long time. Yeah. 
you know, yeah. and then EDM, EDM dubstep, yeah. dubstep, EDM, yeah. Yeah. you know. Um, but no, actually, it's, uh, underground music, I, 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 know, I see it, it's coming back a lot. And yeah. Everybody can attest to that, right. you know. So a little bit, a, a little a bit thing. less focus on just the the chart topping bangers. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, EDM was holding it strong. I mean, dubstep held it strong for a little bit. EDM sure, held yeah. it strong for a really long time. But even now, you see the same people who are in the EDM, you know, listen, going crazy over Dirty Bird now. Yeah, you know? right. So you see the same people, and yeah. then you hear Deep House, you know, at these raves. They call it Deep House, a little different, but mm -hmm. definitely not the EDM they hear uh, used to hear. You know, so at these festivals, you'll hear. What, uh, what the ravers are calling deep house, you mm. know, which is more on the house side. Right. You know? So right. Um, now I see that EDM wave, you know, kind of, kind of rolling over, yep. you know, in house coming back up. Yeah. That techno, yeah. It's interesting. You have uh, something, worldwide. Yeah. Right. I mean, you have something like Dirty Bird, which is kind of, I mean, it's underground, and I think it, by nature their their kind of ethos and their you know the, the what they put into their music is kind of underground, mm -hmm. and even as it's gotten popular now, it like it's it appeals to the masses though. It even appeals to the masses. It right. has, man, I mean, they've come a long way. I mean, that's like to say like they have their own sound. It's mm -hmm. like people can just say, yeah, it sounds like Dirty Bird. Yeah, yeah. no, it you has know? its distinct. But that's yeah. just yeah. a testament of how large they've grown from mm -hmm. start out here. Right. You know, and right. it's like kudos to them. I mean, but that's it's yeah. to me. It's kind of like a don't shoot me over this but it's mm -hmm. like it's almost like a stepping stone it's like you kind of get mm -hmm. those converts over that might have been on more into the like the edm stuff yeah and they kind of get that exposure uh, like you know you can, dirty birds house music sure but yeah. it's its own style you know you kind of get that converted over and then like i'm, I'm happy to see that because at least people are stepping into that and then mm -hmm. from there you know their eyes kind of widen to what else is out there right it's like now like oh wow this is house music i've never seen it and then it's like What's this sound? This is yep. house music, but this sounds different. Yeah. What's this? This is crazy. This is dark. <laughs> yeah. That's techno. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, right. it's like, it's, yeah. so it's, that's kind of how I found uh, drum and bass. You know, I got I, the the dubstep thing was going on. It was real big. Of course, you know, it went from electro and then d electro and dubstep were kind of being played together. And then I was like, "What is this like? Why is this so fast? Why are these drums?" And it was it was drum and bass. Um, uh, it used to be called jungle. Jungle, yeah, right. Oh, no, they're, yeah. They're, they're, they were different. Yeah, they're different. They're different. Yeah, there, there is jungle, yeah. drum and jungle, bass. Yeah. Those are different, liquid yeah. drum and bass. I mean, you have all. Like, yeah, I remember sets. that first rave I went to back in 2000. We go back to that. It was a uh, it was a house techno tent. I imagine it's 15,000 people, so these tents mm. are massive themselves, you know. Uh, house and techno, trance, and jungle and drum and bass. Yeah. You know, so there's three different right. ones. And or if you, the, if you want to go uh, really old school, then you go to the chill room with just the down tempo playing. Yeah. yeah. And the mattresses. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The come down. Yeah, the come down. <laughs> yeah. The down tempo room. Right. But yeah. The chill, the chill room. The chill room. Yes. Yeah. But back to what you guys are saying, though, yeah. Um, even there was even a quote that Carl Cox said, and it's kind of in memes down and everything, but he says he, he, he doesn't. In, in so many words, he says, you know, he doesn't knock EDM because in mm -hmm. a way it's a gateway for people to find electronic music. Yeah. They find EDM, then later on they find their Sven Voth, they find their Marco yes. Corollas. Which is exactly know. how it happens. Yeah, you and know? the truth is, even though EDM and underground music are, are separate, are different different sounds, different cultures, uh, it's all electronic music, whether you, whether yeah. you know, it's one way or another you yeah, say it's electronica. Like, yeah. you know? House so. music and techno music was labeled EDM at one point, but... It was just mm -hmm. as a description. It was just saying, oh, yeah, this is electronic dance music. Yes. Um, but EDM is a genre now. Right. Well, Rather I, yeah, than it's it being a, a description. Sound. I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I say EDM is more of a, not just a, uh, not just a genre and not just a sound, but also a culture as well, it, too. Yeah, it is, for sure. Just yeah. so for you, sure. you can see a crowd of people. It's kind of say, become rave well, culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of syn synonymous yeah, with exactly. rave culture. And then, like, the, you know, like you're not, the old school ravers, like, you which which is different because yeah, it's kind of different because old school going ravers. Bill, going to Bill Graham on a Friday night is yeah. not going to a rave when it's over at twelve. Yeah, no, right, right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> my, my first rave, we left at seven a.m. and it still wasn't even over. Yeah, you're you know? right, right. And well, you're not going to see you're not going to see many candy kids at a electronic music event, but EDM. Yeah, something yeah. you know at, at the Bill Graham it's like you know candy mm -hmm. kids galore yeah so yeah so EDM started off yeah, as, a, as a genre of sound and then just it turned into a culture so you can see mm -hmm. a group of people with no, not hear anything and just like it's an EDM right. culture an yeah. EDM group you know yeah um, so it's all I, I'd say EDM is a culture as well not just a right. sound or anything you right. know so. That's, I, I try to uh, keep that in mind too especially now later like as I'm making music and, and producing music I'm sure you, you, uh, you uh, can relate to this but um, you know like 
I, I try to keep in mind those festivals that have multiple genres in different tents and stuff like mm-hmm. that. And try not to like put myself in a box and be like, oh, this isn't, you know, this isn't what I was trying to make when I sat down to make music. I'm kind of like, I'm just going to let it go where it goes because mm-hmm. maybe this track is, uh, is what I'm, maybe it's going to be good and it's how, it's where my mind state is right now and it'll end up being played in the, the come down tent. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Or maybe you'll make another one the next day because this is kind of, my style is very kind of like all over the place. Maybe the next one's meant for, you know, peak hour at uh, you know main stage or yeah, something. It's, you know, uh, music. Uh, it's definitely for me. It's mood based. Yes. It's like if I'm right. you know starting a project, it's like the end outcome is always like, oh, I can tell what mood I was in. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or you know, the next morning you go listen to the loop you made and you decide to delete it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, I was pissed off. <laughs> Yeah, right, no. and sometimes you don't even know what mood you were yeah, in. You no, know? You, yeah. you don't, uh, I mean, yeah. you're not going to sit down in a bad mood and make music. It never works that way. It's no, like you can't. You just it doesn't work that way. But right. something's going on in the back of your head. Yeah, I think that kind of goes same thing too with finding music and downloading music. You know, sure, yeah. sometimes you put it in a car and the next day, listen, mm-hmm. they be like, "What the hell was I listening to? What, the, what was I thinking? I don't know." Right, you know, so yeah. it's just kind of what mood you are when you're hearing things too. You yeah, know? yeah. So. Way too aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, way too hard. Yeah. <laughs> cool, man. Well, um, let's uh, let's wrap this up. I'm starting to get hungry. Um, oh, me too. Again, yeah. Um, but I, I thank you guys for uh, for coming here and, and, so and being on too, the podcast, man. man. It's <laughs> our, been a our pleasure. Thank yeah. you, man. Thank yeah. you. So I hope you guys had fun. Absolutely. Um, and I always tell this to my guests, like I I, I want to uh, not you know I'd like to have you guys back and not have this just be the the you know the one time yep. uh, podcast or whatever. Um, so uh, yeah. I will uh, kind of do our closing thing here. Um, if you guys want to check us out, this has been the Voice of Electronic Music pos- podcast, episode 16 with Mark DeSantis and David Paul. Do you guys want to plug anything? Um, our spring breaker next next Friday, yeah. which is also my birthday, at the Great Northern. Uh, we got a double headliner night. Uh, Juliet Fox from Berlin is coming, as well as Shelly Johansson from Toronto. Sick. Uh, Going to be a techno night. Uh, I'm working with uh, Christian Panera on that. Mark will be playing uh, Zara from our team as well. Nice. And about a handful of other local you, DJs. And birthday boy. Yes. And you, I'll be birthday on the decks. boy. <laughs> I haven't been on the decks too much lately, so yeah. I'll be back on the decks. And That's then, awesome. uh, then the, speaking of After Hours Underground's the following night, yeah. we haven't announced it yet, but uh, we're doing an After Hours Underground. Yes. Nice. That's Can't exciting. Can't tell any details like that, but hit us up directly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll try to make it to that to that one. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'll give you info that. Plug the, uh, the email list. Oh, yeah, the yeah. email list. You guys want to join our subscription. It's uh, Funky Tech with a K, funkytech.sf at gmail.com. Nice. That's a good way to get looped into uh, yep. to all the parties and that yep. sort of thing. Totally. Yeah, totally. Email blast for every party. Nice. Uh, and then DeSantis Music on SoundCloud? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. D-S-A-N-T-I-S. Nice. Music. There you go. <laughs> Good shit. <laughs> Stay up to date. Yeah. And uh, if you guys want to check out uh, our other uh, episodes or, you know, subscribe or whatever, we are on basically every you know, uh, platform out there, SoundCloud, Stitcher, uh, Spotify, all of them, uh, Mixcloud. Um, so you can check it out. And uh, I got to thank Gina, Ria, Leah, and Jojo for letting us uh, host here at Halcyon. at Halcyon. Love you, ladies. One of the best nightclubs in San Francisco and maybe the world. <laughs> so um, we will see you guys on the next one. And uh, thanks for joining us.